Well, thank you for that prayer, Jamie. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> as some of you know, my wife and I are preparing to move. Uh, it's just a little move for us all the way down to Houston, Texas. Not that far. So, uh, and, uh, but I want to say at the outset here, thank you. Thank you for all that you have meant to, to me, to my family over the years. You have been a family unto us. I was reflecting just the other day how when we moved into our current home, many of you showed up and we moved in less than, I think it was like less than an hour Everything was in the house. That was just phenomenal. So, and if you want to show up when the trailer shows up at my house again, <laughs> hey, come on. So thank you, sincerely. Thank you for allowing me to serve here uh, in capacity as a teacher, as elder, um, occasionally guest preacher, and, and, and so on. Thank you. So... Well, today I want to, I'm bringing uh, a message on who is God, who is God. My text this morning will come from 1 Kings um, uh, chapter 18, verses 20 through 40, and I can already tell I'm not going to be able to see the slide out there. Is there any way we could get these two lights turned off up here? If you can work on that, that way I can see my slides back there. But again, the title of my message is, is, Who is God? Well, I don't know if you're a watcher of politics, but I would imagine that if you are, you are going to have probably the most fun in your life in this election cycle ever. Um, it, it seems like, you know, our politics, uh, our national politics have become uh, almost a reality show on TV. You really, I mean, there's as much entertainment there as there is in any other reality show on TV. And it wasn't that long ago, actually just a couple of months ago, that uh, Pete Buttigieg, you know, the, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, uh, who uh, is running for president, he uh, criticized Mike Pence's version of Christianity, our, our Vice President Mike Pence. And it was such a, an interesting uh, uh, event, uh, and he actually accused Mike Pence of being sort of hypocritical. And, and what became really apparent, if you listen to the comments, and really Mike Pence didn't give much of a response other than that Buttigieg should know better because they know each other. They're from the same, our, our home state, by the way. So, uh, but what was very apparent in that is that they have different, it's almost like they had different visions of who God is and what he's like. Um, and our country is obviously deeply divided. We're deeply politically divided. But I would assert to you that we're not just deeply divided over politics, but that the core issue really is who God is and what he's like. And sometimes, who is God? That's where the real division is. Um, and even though we are divided today, at other times we've been divided over these issues too. Uh, it was not that uh, at the beginning of our country, actually even before it began, uh, you had the first great awakening, and prior to that, the country was beginning to divide over who God is and what God is like. Um, and you had, at that time in the early 1700s, uh, ideas, false God views or God images, images of who God is and what God is like, uh, such as the Enlightenment rationalism. That sounds like a big word, but it means that the God that exists is the God of my understanding, and what of God I don't understand doesn't exist. And so, if I don't understand it, that's not what God is like. That was rationalism. And so, Christianity, where, where that infected Christianity, uh, Christianity became sort of an intellectual ascent. Uh, also, deism. Pastor mentioned this one already, but it's like God is a watchmaker who created the universe as a watch uh, 
and wound it up and then sat back and it's now running on its own steam. He doesn't interfere in the affairs of men. That idea was made, had made its way to our shores in the early 1700s and was influencing us. Unitarianism. Unitarianism was the belief that God is one person uh, and that Jesus was only a good teacher, fully human, but just a good teacher, uh, human only. That's Unitarianism. It had made its way to our shores. And finally, Universalism. Universalism was the idea that all people ultimately get to heaven. Uh, all people ultimately uh, get saved. And that idea had made its way to our shores as well. And in the midst of all of this division and confusion about who God is and what he is like, came a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards that you see here. Jonathan Edwards preached for 14 years on the sovereignty of God as his primary theme. You see, every revival begins with a greater and deeper vision of who God is and what he is like. And Jonathan Edwards preached for 14 years before the first great revival in America. We call that the First Great Awakening. This happened in the early 1700s. And the First Great Awakening was really a rediscovery of the absolute sovereignty of God. And he preached on the nature of God uh, again and again and again. And most people actually credit the First Great Awakening with the preaching of George Whitfield, but it was preceded again by Jonathan Edwards' preaching. In fact, he was so enraptured with the presence and the person of God that at times he would, he would go out, and usually in the evenings, and he'd walk out in the woods and out in the fields, and he would commune with God and pray and praise God. And he was so enraptured with the presence of God and the person of God that at times he wouldn't come home at dark and his wife would have to send people out to get him and they would find him out in the fields or out in the woods on his face before God, praising God. Revival broke out in his church and his most famous sermon, and I, I think that it's actually not the best selection. I, there are many great sermons that he preached, but he's most known for his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's actually not very characteristic of Jonathan Edwards. Um, it, it is uh, not his favorite subject, you might say. He would preach law to the lost and then offer grace. But hell without the preaching of law makes no sense. Uh, but this particular Sunday, he was preaching on the reality of hell. And it said, and it's recorded by people who were there, that hell became such a reality that it's as if the floor of the church opened up and they could see the very fires of hell. People were literally hanging onto the pews to avoid falling into hell. So the First Great Awakening was about a deeper vision of God's sovereignty. The Second Great Awakening happened about a hundred years later in the early 1800s. And the primary leader of this was a man by the name of Charles Finney. And preceding this, the, the Second Great Awakening really was about a rediscovery of the holiness of God. And the fact that God requires holiness and righteousness on our part and that He is holy and righteous. And Charles Finney, it was said of him that as he would travel across the country, various parts of the country, um, that people uh, would come in off the streets, would walk by even the, the place where he was preaching, the church and and the gathering halls where he was preaching, just walking by, they would fall under conviction and run into the church uh, to 
to repent and to come to know Christ. At one point, he was traveling in one town and he was invited to come speak at a, a business, a textile manufacturing place. And even as he was walking through, as he was being given a tour before he began to speak, uh, the ladies who were at their stations uh, working these textiles began to fall on their face before God and confessing their sin and repenting before God. That was the second great awakening. And again, every revival in this country, every revival in the church begins with a greater and deeper appreciation for who God is and what he is like. You see, these revivalists understood that the core issue for individuals and for nations is the nature of the God that they worship. Individuals and nations, you see, become like the God they worship. Today, we again are deeply divided. We have many false images of God, and we desperately need a third great awakening in our country. You see, the God of naturalism, naturalism is a worldview that believes that all that exists, the only thing that exists is the material world. The God of naturalism is nature, and it's very dominant in, our, in certain sectors of our culture today. And so that's a very different God. Uh, also, the God of secular humanism reigns. Secular humanism is the belief that our future is in our hands. We are the masters of our own fate. It's all up to us, and we save ourselves. And so the God of secular humanism is humans. There is no other God. We save ourselves. On the airwaves of our country, and perhaps our greatest export ideologically from the American Christian church is today the God of the prosperity gospel. It's, you find it now in the sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of Asia, in China, and other places, but it began here. Um, and so the God of the prosperity gospel is sort of a slot machine God, where if you get the right combination of prayer and the right combination, you give the right amount of money, you get that back tenfold, uh, you pray this particular prayer, you get what you want from God, and God is obligated then to, to give you what you desire. That's the God of the prosperity gospel, and it's replete in our culture today, particularly on our airwaves. There's another God that you may not have heard of, another philosophy that you may not have heard of. Back in 2005, two sociologists uh, from up here in South Bend at Notre Dame University, Smith and Denton, did some research, and they published this in, in, a, in a book called The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers. And so this is the God that I'm about to describe of our younger generations today. And they refer to this as moralistic therapeutic deism. Here's what that means. They found that this is the God primarily of American teenagers today, that there is a God who exists, who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. So far, so good. They also found that they believe that God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other as taught in the Bible and by most world religions, ignoring the fact that people differ on what it means to be good and different religions differ on what it means to be good. And in fact, from a Christian point of view, we can't be good enough. If that were the case, if we could be good enough, Christ would never have had to come. The third tenet of this moralistic therapeutic deism is this. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Uh, the fourth, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And finally, good people get to go to heaven when they die. There isn't necessarily a hell in this belief system, 
Um, again, uh, apparently bad people just die and that's the end of them. Uh, so that's moralistic therapeutic deism and these researchers found that this is pretty characteristic of, of uh, our younger generations today. Uh, to kind of paraphrase all of that, this God is the great therapist in the sky. He exists to make us feel good about ourselves. Okay? So where do these ideas come from? Again, we're deeply divided on who God is and what he is like. Where do we get these ideas, this, what we call a God image or God views, these false gods? Where do we get them from, these distortions of God? Well, there are several sources, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. I could go into each one of these rather deeply. But we get them from our parental figures in our life. We come to know God. These are the earliest, earliest influences on our God image, who we understand God to be. Uh, also, church authorities influence us in this direction. Church and religious authorities, as well as... Uh, experiences of suffering uh, and uh, cultural influence uh, and finally outright satanic deception. Those are all sources of these distortions of who God is and what he's like. Well, America is not unique uh, in this sense. There was a time in Israel's history, actually multiple times, um, when they were deeply divided on who God is and what he's like. During the time of the prophet Elijah, as one such occasion, and Israel needed a profound change in their vision of God. False gods had made their way into the land of Israel. The, northern king, the kingdom of Israel was deeply divided between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom at this time. And so we read about this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 40. And I won't uh, read the whole thing uh, because it's kind of lengthy, but I will read parts of this. But you know the story. This is prophet Elijah who is uh, quite upset about all this idolatry that is taking place. You had King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And so through them, idolatry came. They began to worship Baal and and other gods in the northern kingdom, and uh, began to set up in the high places, the, the hills and the mountains, uh, idols and, and, and areas for idol worship, and began to practice. And down in the valleys, they began to sacrifice their children to false gods. And so Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, and he challenges Israel with this, decide today who is your God? And he, with that, he challenges the prophets of Baal uh, up on Mount Carmel. And so he gets them there and he, he has them to erect an altar. And he says, the one who calls down fire from heaven, that is God. He is God. And so here we read in verse 24. And he tells the prophets of Baal, and you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of Yahweh, the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. And so he has them to, they build an altar, and they call out, and they cry out for hours, and they begin to hit themselves, and cut themselves, and cause themselves to bleed. And so again, he challenges the character of, of their God. He says this in verse 27. And at noon Elijah mocked them saying. Cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is musing. Uh, uh, or he is relieving himself. Or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep. And must be awakened. So he lightheartedly mocked their God. He challenged the character of Baal. And you know that they aren't able to call down fire from heaven. And so Elijah has them to erect, he erects an altar and he digs a pit out around the altar and he douses the altar. He puts wood on the altar and he douses the wood. He fills up the pit with water and then he begins to 
pray, and this is what he says. Uh, and at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, Yahweh, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And you know that fire came down and consumed the offering, consumed the wood, uh, and even dried up all the water uh, around uh, the altar there. And the central question here in this whole event was this, who is God? Who is God? And this is the same question that we face today. Who is God? And related to that, what is he like? What is this God like? And so today what I want to do is I want to focus in on three of the top distortions, the three top false images or false gods in our culture today because we are seeing these begin to penetrate the church, and they're influencing the church. And so, again, every revival that has ever taken place began with a deeper and greater appreciation, a greater understanding, a greater knowledge of who God is and what He is like. So, let's look at these today. Um, I'm sorry, and then verse 38 and 39, to end the story with Elijah, it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, Yahweh, He is God. Yahweh, He is God. So let's look today. And so if you have your handout in your bulletin, you can follow Along with me today, we're going to look at these top three distortions, these top three false images of God in our culture. So, false God number one. God exists for me and my purposes. This is the God of the prosperity gospel and the God of moralistic therapeutic deism, the great therapist in the sky. And there are a number of corollaries to this, uh, associated beliefs with this. God exists to prosper me. He exists to make me fat, sassy, and happy. Uh, he exists to bring blessings to me. He exists to give me a big house, to give me a private jet, to give me a nice car. He exists to keep me healthy, to keep me happy, to keep me well. He exists to make me feel good about myself, that's the primary purpose for his existence. God exists to make me feel happy, to make me feel good. He exists to help me achieve my plans and my dreams. But the biblical God, the God of Scripture, is not that. The biblical God exists for himself primarily. Now, you might say, that sounds narcissistic. He loves himself most of all. And that would be true if God were simply human, because all humans are equal. And so a human uh, who uh, loves himself most of all, who exists for himself most of all, we would think of as selfish, narcissistic, proud. But God is not simply human. God is different. God is other. God is the highest being, and He is the only one who has the right and the only one who ha has that obligation to love Himself most of all. And He has designed us in such a way that we need Him to be that way. It is what brings us the greatest joy because we find our joy in Him. And so if God existed for any other creature primarily, 
whatever that creature, whoever that creature is, would be God. He would be greater than God. God exists for himself most of all. Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, revivalist preacher that I mentioned a moment ago, wrote a book called The End for Which God Created the World, and his primary conclusion is this. God exists for his greatest, his own greatest pleasure and joy and will. And that is right of him to do so. Psalms 115 says this, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Not what we please, not what pleases us, not what makes us happy, not what makes us feel good. Now, when we find ourselves in him and we find our greatest delight and joy in him, we are pleased. We are filled with joy. But we're filled with joy because God enjoys himself most of all. You see, the picture of the Trinity in classical Christianity is this, where you have the Father and the Son. The Son is the express image of the Father. Both are infinite beings, infinite creatures, and they take delight in each other. So the Father loves the Son most deeply. The Son loves the Father most deeply. And their love for each other is infinite. Their joy in each other is most infinite. And as the Father beholds the Son, He beholds Himself. As the Son beholds the Father, the, Father, the, the Son beholds Himself. And there is this intimate, infinite knowledge of each other, this intimate, infinite love of each other. And this love is so great, this joy is so great, this unity and union between them is so great that it gives rise to the Holy Spirit whose primary job is to wrap us up and bring us right up into the midst of this great love and joy fest. That is the classic image of the Trinity. God loves himself most of all and we need him to be that way. That is what brings us joy. God is foremost in his own thoughts, in his own emotions, and in his own actions. And we benefit because of that. So false image number one, God exists for me and my purposes. The reality is God exists primarily for himself and we exist primarily for God. False image number two. God needs me or God needs us. And there are several corollaries to this. God can't help but to love me. God can't help but to love us. Or God loves us most. Or God loves me most. Or I or we are worthy of God's love. These ideas, even though we may not express it that way, these ideas have made it into the church. Have made it into the church. And it shows up in many places. It shows up, for example, in our worship music. So here's an, an example. This is the song Reckless Love. Um, and it's sung in many churches. And so you see the words here. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Love of God, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Now it contains enough biblical truth to make it acceptable uh, in many churches. But if you look at the overall picture that is painted here, the overall picture it, that's painted here is of a lovesick young man who is, has a desperate need to be with uh, his girl. That's the picture that is painted. So theologians who understand classical Christian theology refer to this kind of idea as the Jesus is my boyfriend theology. Uh, that's what it's, it's referred to. And it paints a picture as though there is some need or deficit in God that is driving him uh, in some kind of way. Uh, by, the idea, what, by, by the way, what is the definition of reckless? Well, 
I, I looked that up. Here's from Miriam Webster. Reckless means it's marked by a lack of proper caution, a careless of consequences. Uh, the second definition, irresponsible. Is the God that we serve, the God of Scripture, the God of the Bible, is he careless? Is he irresponsible? Words have meaning and words are important, particularly when we attach them to God. And so all worship music is actually theology set to music, to, to music is what it is. And so we need to be careful about the theology in our music. So the idea that God needs us or God needs me, the correction is that actually in classical Christian thought, God is all sufficient within himself. Acts chapter 17, uh, this is Paul preaching, again, presenting a different vision of God to the scholars of Athens on the Areopagus. He's preaching here, and this is what he says as part of his presentation of God. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is all sufficient within himself. He doesn't need us. The reason that God has revealed himself to us, the reason that God uh, has manifested himself, the reason that Jesus came is not because of some deficit or need within himself. He has all that he needs within himself as the Trinity. The reason he came was to manifest his glory to us and bring us into that glory. That's the reason that he came. So false image number two, um, God needs me or us. False image number three, God is only love, or he's exclusively or nearly exclusively just love, uh, regardless of the other attributes or to the exclusion of any other attributes. So the corollaries of this belief, everyone gets to go to heaven. After all, a God who loves only would never send anyone to hell. God doesn't condemn anyone is another corollary. Uh, because if God is only love, love would never condemn anyone. Uh, God accepts us as we are. That's a very common one. Uh, I would say that the reality of that is this. God accepts us as Jesus is, and because of his substitutionary sacrifice, he accepts us despite how we are. That's a very different idea. That's classical Christian understanding. God winks at our sin is another corollary of this idea. Or here's one that's very common in church today. The God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the, Old Te of the New Testament. We see the God of the Old Testament as a God of wrath. Whereas the God of the New Testament, the primary picture we have is of Jesus with the little children. He's this gentle, loving God. And so we see those very differently. The reality is this. The God of the Bible is not just loving. He's also a God of holiness. In fact, if there's any one attribute that we could say that is superlative is the primary attribute of God, it would be holiness. The way the ancient Jews understood uh, the character of God when they wanted to describe something, they would describe it in, in triple, uh, in, in threes. And so uh, when they would do that, they were saying that this is who God is primarily. This is, is God more than anything else. Not to the exclusion of everything else, but more than anything else. And the only thing that, is, the only attribute that is related to us uh, in three and in, in sets of three is God is holy, holy, holy. The seraphim who fly above the throne, who echo God's praise eternally, infinitely. What did they say? Holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. Revelation chapter 15. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. God is a God of holiness, righteousness, and justice. And his love will reflect his holiness and his righteousness and his justice. Also, our understanding of Jesus. Sometimes we see Jesus almost exclusively as the Jesus who calls the little children to him. Now that's an accurate picture of God, that Jesus is loving and tender and gentle, and he called the little children unto himself. But when you see Jesus as that alone, you have a distorted image of Jesus. Here's another image that you may not be entirely aware of. This is Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God." And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the roaring press of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The same Jesus who called the children to his lap is the same Jesus who will one day wield the sword and wreak the wrath of God on the ungodly. It's the same Jesus. Jesus is also judge and the executioner as well. So false image number three, God is only love. These are the top three false gods, and to the degree that we hold to distortions, lies about who God is and what He's like, those become false gods. So you see that uh, every the Christian life is a life of continual repentance from false gods, from idols of the heart to the true God of the Bible. That is what the Christian life is. Uh, and the primary task, therefore, of the Christian life uh, is repentance from these false idols. John Calvin, the great reformer, said that the human heart is a veritable factory of idols. So again, our primary task is to know God as He is and as we wish Him to be, to pursue God as He is. We don't come into Christianity as a blank slate. We come with distortions and lies that operate within our heart. And again, the Christian life is a life of continual repentance from these false gods, these idols of the heart, to the true God. Revival, every revival begins with repentance from our false gods, false images of God. So whether that's in your life, and by the way, the only reason we don't have revival in our nation, in the church, the only reason you don't have a revived heart is because you're willing to live without it. That's the only reason. 
So in your life, this is why it is so necessary that we immerse ourselves in Scripture, that we come to understand the God of Scripture. We read it, we meditate on it, we study. We come to know this God and we commune with God in prayer. In the church, preaching, the primary purpose of preaching, uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote, was to reveal God to a godless uh, and idolatrous people. To reveal God, to proclaim God as He is. And we need, desperately need, corporate prayer where we uh, seek God uh, on our knees, in our faces, uh, in the church, for revival in the church, in our nation. It's interesting that historically, up until the 1960s, uh, every student in uh, America, every child in America was to read the farewell address of George Washington every year. That's gone. We don't do that. Most of us have probably never read that. I would encourage you to read that. He says, as part of his address, that the two primary supports of a democratic republic are religion and morality. Religion and he wasn't referring to Islam. He wasn't referring to Buddhism. He's referring to Christianity, religion, and morality. And we need in our nation to elect men and women to lead us who understand the role of religion and morality in our culture. Every revival begins with a greater and deeper appreciation of who God is. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Minister to us today, we pray. Use your word. Um, Holy Spirit, nurture it. Let it produce its fruit in us. And may it be for your glory. In the name of Christ. Amen.